In the last lecture, we looked at the foundations of molecular orbital theory, and I talked about using the variational principle in the context of molecular orbitals formed as linear combinations of atomic orbitals, and the variational principle allows me to determine the best coefficients in my linear combination of atomic orbitals, where best is defined by delivering the lowest possible energy that will be found by solution of a secular equation. So in this lecture I'd like to look more carefully at those integrals, think, think a little bit more about them, and also discuss effective Hamiltonians. And an effective Hamiltonian technique is a, a model by which the values of integrals are assigned, perhaps I'll say, instead of determined in the course of computation. And we'll see more as we go along. I'll try to make that concrete. And so the first question I want to ask is, what are resonance and overlap integrals? And so if, if one can develop an intuitive appreciation for these, as opposed to just hearing the word integral and seeing some abstract concept floating around, uh, that's, a, that's a big step forward. So that is a step along the road of really appreciating what happens in the calculations. So let's start with the easiest integral, and that's the overlap integral. So an overlap integral takes on a value between negative 1 and 1 if my basis functions are normalized. So remember that normalization just means when I integrate over all space the product of a basis function with itself, in particular the product of its complex conjugate with itself, if it's complex, we would call that the square modulus. If it's a real function, then it's just the function squared. If that integral over all space is 1, then the function is normalized. And if it's not 1, we can always divide by whatever it is in order to normalize our functions. Uh, multiply times 1 over that value, and now your integral over all space will be normalized. Uh, but in any case, the value that you get out of an overlap integral measures nearness. So the closer the absolute value of s is to 1, the closer the two basis functions are. And the sign of the overlap integral is just expressing a phase relationship. So if I, just to illustrate that, if I took, say, a px orbital, and I integrate over all space px times px, then I will get 1 if my p orbital is normalized. But let's say I take a px with the opposite phase. So phase would normally be I'd shade one side and leave the other side clear. If I take the overlap of the one that has shade up with the one that has shade down, of course they have exactly the same amplitude everywhere in space, but they have exactly opposite signs. Then I would get negative 1 instead of 1. So the sign tells you something about phase, and the magnitude tells you something about overlap in space. And that's why it's called the overlap integral. It's how close are they, how much do they overlap. So resonance is a little trickier. Uh, and in order to get a better appreciation for the two, let's, let's do an easy one first. And that's a diagonal resonance integral. So diagonal because if I view this h as a matrix of values indexed by two coordinates, then along the diagonal where the coordinate is the same, the 1, 1 position, the 2, 2 position, the 3, 3 position, this is how I write that shorthand notation out. It's the integral over all space, complex conjugate of basis function i, here's basis function i. Well, this is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian for a single basis function. It, if there were an electron in this atomic orbital, what would its energy be? And that's uh, an easy thing to think about. So I've got, let's say this were a 1s orbital on a hydrogen atom. I'd be evaluating the energy for that particular 1s orbital on a hydrogen atom. And poof, that's an easy number. So the resonance integral for a diagonal element is just the energy of an electron in the basis function. So the less intuitive resonance integral then are, are the off-diagonal resonance integrals. So what I want to do is, in order to maybe provide some more insight into that, let's consider a system that has only two basis functions, one and two. And just to make life a little bit easier, let's imagine that the overlap integral between the two normalized orbitals, phi1 and phi2, is equal to zero. All right, so they're normalized, so s11 and s22 equals one, but 
the overlap between the two different ones is zero. So in that simple case, the secular equation, it's easy to write down, zero, that the secular equation is always equal to zero. So I'll make my determinant H11 minus ES11. Well, S11 is just one, so I won't write down one here. I'll have H11 minus E. And over here, I'll have H12 minus ES12. But S12 is zero, so I'll just throw that away. All that's left is H12. And similarly, down here, I, I get these terms. So solving for E, and noting that, the, as I mentioned uh, in the last lecture, the order of these indices doesn't matter. Uh, you can take one on either side, and you get exactly the same number, so these two values are equal to one another. So in that case, I get this times this minus this times this. That is, I'll get for the energy, so that's a quadratic equation, and if I expand this quadratic equation in E squared, and solve it using the quadratic formula, I'll get, and I, the proof is left to the reader, so go ahead and jot this down if you want to try it. This times this minus this times this, solve for E. Uh, e is equal to H11 plus H22 plus or minus the square root of H11 minus H22 squared plus 4H12 squared over 2. And as I say, if you want to prove that to yourself, go ahead, or you can just take my word for it. So I want to look at that those two values of E. So notice there are two values of E here because there's a plus and a minus. And so I want to think about these two values graphically for a minute because it's going to help explain what these resonance integrals really are. So H12 is going to couple orbitals 1 and 2 and it's going to change the state energies. But let me do it sort of step by step. So let me start with let me start with an animation that's a little out of order. So I'm going to put all these terms in here, and then I'll just talk about them. I don't know why they were out of order. So first, let me, let me look at individual terms here. H11 and H22, those are the energies of two different orbitals, if you will. So they're basis functions, right? Basis function orbitals. So sometimes one says function, sometimes one says orbital. You just have to kind of get used to the language and keep track. But... One will be at this energy, and two will be at this energy. Remember that these diagonal resonance integrals just express the energies. And if I want to uh, look at the difference in this energy, which is H22 minus H11, this size of difference, well, another way I could write that is H11 minus H22 squared. It doesn't matter which order I do it in, since I'm squaring it. And then take the square root, right? It's kind of a funny way to do it, but I do it this way because that appears up here. Look, here's the square root of H11 minus H22 squared. So this is just, what's the separation between my two energy, energy levels of basis functions 1 and 2? And now let me take the average of those two energies, right? I'm, and I'm just drawing it graphically, it's halfway in between. That's H11 plus H22 divided by 2. Oh look, that appears in here too. H11 plus H22 divided by 2. So this says, if I'm thinking about creating the energies of my two possible molecular orbitals, I can kind of think that I'm doing it in, you know, step by step. Step one is take the average of my two individual orbital energies. So that's what I've got over here. I've got the average. Now, let's say that h12 were to be equal to zero. So it does not appear. This term goes away, and that would make the two molecular orbital energies plus this term square root minus this term square root. But as we just talked about, these are over two, this term square root is the separation between these two energy levels. So if I divide it by two, I'll have started in the middle, and I add half the separation between them up and half the separation between them down, I come back to exactly the same place I started. This is H22, and this is H11. And if you don't believe me, actually, you can do a little bit of trivial algebra and solve these, and sure enough, you'll end up with H11 and H22. But what about H12? So if H12 is a number, as it is, and I square it, so it will have to be a positive value, I am adding a positive number into this radical, that is in, underneath the square root here, and so 
It must get bigger. The value in this square root must get bigger than it was here. And as a result, I will add a bigger number. So I will push this energy level up and I will pull this energy level down because I'm subtracting a larger square root. So H12 couples the two original states, maybe I'll call them at this, in this case, in order to lower the energy of one at the expense of the other. And that is resonance. So now you can sort of see why these might be called resonance integrals. They allow a mixing of basis functions to improve the energy of one orbital at the expense of another orbital. And many of you have certainly seen this in the context of thinking about perturbational molecular orbital theory, it'll often be called. So now let's talk about effective Hamiltonian or semi-empirical theories. So instances where we're not going to try to solve from first principles, but we're going to take advantage that we now understand qualitatively what are these resonance and overlap integrals supposed to be telling us? They're telling us about energies of sp specific functions. Those are the diagonal resonance integrals. They're telling us about coupling between functions. Those are off-diagonal resonance integrals. And they're telling us about closeness of functions. Those are overlap integrals. So I may have a way to empirically estimate quantitative values without having to actually compute them from first principles. I'm likely to lose some accuracy, but I bet I might get very speedy if I just have some rules, perhaps, for filling in numbers. And so let me tell you about one of the older theories along those lines, and it's called Huckel theory. It was developed in the 1930s by the physicist Eric Huckel uh, and originally applied to unsaturated aromatic hydrocarbons. And so there were certain conventions in Huckel theory. And if you were to go back and look at the last lecture about sort of what are the steps in doing a calculation, remember step one was pick a basis set. And so in Huckel theory, the basis set is formed entirely from parallel carbon 2p orbitals, one per atom. So parallel because it's only designed to be used for the pi system of unsaturated or aromatic hydrocarbons. So whatever p orbitals contribute to the pi system, it, they're often called pz orbitals, but that's just an arbitrary name. We're going to have each carbon bring one 2p orbital to the game. So if I've got nine carbon atoms, I'll have a basis set of nine 2p orbitals. The overlap matrix is defined to be, in Huckel theory, that Sij is equal to the Kronecker delta Ij. That is, they're normalized, so S11 will be equal to 1. So remember, the Kronecker delta, when i and j are the same, you get 1. When i and j are different, you get 0. So that means that all combinations of i and j where j are different, they are orthogonal to one another because S is equal to 0. So it's an orthonormal basis set by fiat, right? If you really did the calculation, two carbon 2p orbitals near each other in space would not have an overlap of zero. But to make life easier, we're going to declare that they do have an overlap of zero. Matrix elements HII. So remember, this is the diagonal resonance integral. What does it mean? It's the energy of an electron in basis function I. But all the basis functions are carbon 2p orbitals. So I ought to use the energy of an electron in a carbon 2p orbital. And in fact, there's a, I could measure that experimentally. I, the easiest way to do that, presumably, would be to find a molecule that has an electron in a carbon 2p orbital. What's the simplest molecule that you could find for which that's true? It's the methyl radical. So methyl radical is average planar and we can talk about average at some later point, but in any case, average planar. So it's as though this extra electron is in a 2p orbital, and I could measure the ionization potential. How much energy does it take to strip off that electron? Turns out to be 9.9 .9 electron volts, and negative that value is the binding energy, so that is HII, minus 9.9 .9 electron volts. Now, Huckel, being a physicist, preferred not to work with numbers. They like symbols. He called that value minus 9.9 .9 electron volts. He called it alpha. And so alpha is just a symbol we're going to use whenever we see an H diagonal. Now, we're almost done, right? 
We know how to fill in all the S's in a secular determinant. We know how to fill in the diagonal H's in a secular determinant. All that's left is to define the off-diagonal elements in Huckel theory. And remember that the off-diagonal elements, they describe the coupling between two different orbitals. And so in a pi system, the coupling that occurs gives rise to pi bonding energies. So here is a, this is ethylene, I guess, if these are hydrogen atoms on the outside. So here is a system that has a pi bond energy, and you would measure the contribution coming from the interaction of the p orbitals by perhaps looking at the rotational barrier in ethylene because when I rotate it 90 degrees, if I rotate one end 90 degrees, by symmetry I have decoupled these two p orbitals. Their, their overlap is zero if I actually computed it rigorously, not just adopting a Huckel convention. Uh, and you know they're just in different planes, they don't couple. So what would the energy of this system be in sort of a Huckel way of thinking? It would just be two times an electron in a p orbital. Whereas over here it's pi so the difference is delta E, 2 EP, this energy, minus E pi, this energy, that's the pi stabilization energy. And so in Huckel theory, you say that that stabilization energy, and it's stabilization, so it's a negative number, distribute it equally between the two p orbitals involved, so I'll divide it in half, and incidentally, it's about, it's about hmm, 30 kcals to do this rotation. So, I, and being a physicist, we're going to give it a name, and the name is beta. So we will use beta for an Hij between nearest neighbors, right? A pi bond occurs between two carbon atoms which are attached to one another. So this is just showing that energy again. Uh, that means that the total pi bond energy will be 2 alpha plus 2 beta. Right? because you've still got these two EPs that are contributing. The electrons are in the p orbitals, but I've also added this resonance interaction, so the pi bond is 2 alpha plus 2 beta, whereas two isolated carbon atoms would be 2 alpha. That would be when you'd rotated the ethylene. And I'm sorry, I said it was about 30. It's 30 is beta, 60 is the rotation energy. So divide 60 in half, you get 30. Or if you like electron volts, 2.6 electron volts. Finally, that was for the off-diagonal resonance integral between bonded partners. The next thing in Huckel theory is to just decide that if you're more distant than nearest neighbors, we will take this resonance integral to be zero. There's no interaction between two p orbitals that are on two different carbon atoms that are not bonded one to another. And I'm done. I have all the rules I need. So in the next lecture, we'll actually look at applying Huckel theory to a particular system, namely the allyl system. But for this lecture, the last thing I'd like you to take away and think about is, let's say I wanted to be a little bit more general than original Huckel theory. I want to do systems other than simply unsaturated planar carbon systems. So what would I need to do if I wanted to extend Huckel theory to include, you know what, I'll, I'll keep things planar. But let's say I wanted to include nitrogen and oxygen atoms. So now I want to be able to do pyridine, for instance, in addition to benzene, or furan in addition to benzene. So what steps would I have to take in order to do that extension so that I could continue to have rules to just fill in a secular equation? And I'll let you think about that, and next lecture we'll look at an actual application of Huckel theory.